Hey everybody, welcome to the very first introductory video for our stats labs in Jamovi this semester. This is not going to be a copy of the lab, but this is going to be an example of just running through a data set and doing a couple of different things that will allow us to hopefully get familiar with some of the types of tasks that we'll be expected to do on our very first lab. And it'll also serve as a decent little introduction to Jamovi as well. I've already loaded in our data set. This is the Beach Swim Advisories data set that I've used in class. Um, it talks about uh, beaches in Chicago. It looks at their predicted E. coli level, a probability that that predicted E. coli level is, or the actual E. coli level, sorry, is higher than a certain threshold, and then whether or not a swim advisory was issued. You can see there's a date column, there's this other C column here, and then there's this record ID column that we've got. Let's just jump over to variables up on the top first, and I'm going to do some work here. Uh, I'm going to rename this C variable, and this is actually going to be uh, a date order. I'll go back to the data and you can see what I mean here. This is a column that I put in manually. Um, I just used a formula for it, but uh, you'll notice our date column is here. Um, and I just added in a column that instead of looking at the actual date, it just counts the days from this original starting date. So it's just a little counter along the way in case we end up using that in later examples. Uh, so we're not going to use that in this example or in this lab or anything like that, but that's what that is. We can go ahead and double click on some of these or, or click on edit or setup or whatever, and uh, we can kind of go through each variable and see what kinds of options Jamovi gives us. We can add a description to all of these. We can change the measure type from nominal to ordinal to continuous to just an identification variable. So right now this is nominal. The data type is text, which makes sense. These are all beach names. There is no real order in here, so they're just listed in alphabetical order. The date is an ID variable. I could change this to an ordinal variable, and then it would have all of these levels in order here. Uh, that would get us around having to use this date order column, but whatever. Um, I'll just leave it as uh, ID here for now. Uh, the date order that we have, though, uh, is continuous, and it's also an integer data type. We could change this to a decimal, but that doesn't really make sense in this context because there's not really like a 4.78 measure. We're just looking at specific days, so I'll leave that here. The predicted level is a decimal continuous variable. Uh, the probability, we're expecting these to be in decimals and these are continuous as well. Our swim advisories are nominal. There's just yeses and nos in here. Uh, and then our record ID is just a text. You can look at the data itself. It's just like the beach name followed with a code representing the date, I think. Um, so nothing interesting there. We're not really going to use that. What we might want to do, though, is just take a look at our data a little bit. So I'm going to quickly grab a little summary. And this is just for illustration purposes only. You're not going to have to do something like this right away. I'm going to go into analyses, and I'm going to go into the exploration menu. That's where we're going to live in this example. And I'm going to click on descriptives. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is just close that data set. Um, there's a button up in the top right that you can't see that I clicked. And I want to look at the predicted level variables and the probability variables here. And I'm just going to look at a really quick summary table. Two things jump right out to me. You'll notice that I've got this little menu where I can check what statistics are being shown. Let me maybe just get rid of some of these that we don't care about. There we go. Do you see what's interesting to me on here? Our minimum value for the predicted level of E. coli is negative 1,000, whatever the units are. It's like parts per something, probably parts per million. I don't know. Um, and then our probability uh, that our E. coli level is above some certain threshold, our minimum value is negative 1. Now, that doesn't make sense to me. Those minimums should both be 0, theoretically, right? Uh, we can't have a negative amount of E. coli that we are predicting to exist in our water samples, and we also aren't going to have a negative probability of any sort. So this is maybe a little concerning. Uh, this is something that you don't have to worry about. I will help you with all this stuff and give you clean data sets. But it is just an interesting thing to see that we can go ahead and notice that there's something going on here. 
There are a couple more instances of this throughout the data set where we get these wonky values in our predicted level and our probability. I suspect this just has to do with some sort of a measurement error and that impacted our model somehow. And so these predicted values got out of range and so the probabilities got all wonky too. Uh, it could also be that these are like placeholders for some other like not able to measure things. So we just put these ridiculous numbers in here. Either way, what I'm going to do is filter them out. So I clicked on the filter button and I'm just going to say, let's only look at the instances where probability is greater than or equal to zero. I can add a description to this, just say like clean up the weird values. And you can notice that these just get X'd out. So they're still in our actual file, but they're not going to be considered in the data set moving forward unless we turn off that filter. I can go back to my analyses and I can see my table now and it looks like I have much more reasonable minimums. My, reason, my minimum uh, for the predicted value of E. coli was 7.60 parts per million, I think it is. Um, and our probability minimum that would correspond with that is 0 0.004, so that's 0.4%. Uh, and again, this is a predicted probability that, or a probability that the actual level of E. coli is higher than 500, uh, whatever units they are. I don't want to keep saying parts per million in case that's wrong, but cool. Maybe we want to do a little bit more data manipulation and stuff like that. I'll show us really quickly how to just add in a column because I think that's interesting. So what I might do is just say, let's add a column. We'll append it at the very end. And I'm going to make this a transformed variable. What we're going to do is we are going to add a column that represents uh, low, medium, and high predicted E. coli levels. So these are going to be our uh, E. coli levels, they're going to be based on our predicted level. So that's our source variable. And the transformation that we're going to use, we're going to have to create a new transformation. Essentially, we're going to create a new rule that takes these numerical values and changes them to something else. The nice thing is that if we use these kinds of transformations over and over again on different data sets, we can keep them um, and play with them a little bit. Uh, but here, we'll just call this low, medium, high. Uh, the maximum of this data set uh, or of these, this variable was uh, 1543. So let's just divide it up into 500s. That'll work for us. So here, back into our E. coli one, um, I want to edit my transformation. And I'm just going to add some recode conditions. I'm going to have three of them here. And I'm going to say if our source, which remember we set to be the predicted level, is less than 500, then I'm going to say low E. coli. Uh, else... If we're less than a thousand, uh, oops, that says a hundred. There we go, a thousand. I'm going to say there's like a medium uh, amount of E. coli. Otherwise, we'll say very high. Notice I'm putting quotes around the actual words that I'm using to make sure that Jamovi knows this is text that I'm putting in here. Uh, once I do this, I can see my column switched to an ordinal variable from a continuous one. The little icon switched. Uh, and it automatically has the levels based on here because we've coded those in, right? Uh, we could change the measure type if you want. We could say, okay, let's force it to be ordinal on here. But normally the auto measure type uh, is pretty good. It'll figure that stuff out decently well. I'm not going to use this variable, uh, this column in the rest of the stuff that we're going to do. But we talked in class about how we can kind of create our own categories out of numerical data. And that's one way of doing it. So I wanted to just show you how that looks. Let's go back into our analyses and take a look at a frequency distribution. I'm just going to click on this and it'll pop up all the different options for this descriptives exploration stuff. So let's go ahead and get rid of this little table that we had to motivate us cleaning up some data here. And instead, we're going to take a look at some basic histograms. So you can see in the plots, I can add in a histogram. There's no data that I'm looking at here, and so it's not showing me anything. But let's just take a look at the histogram of the predicted level. So here's our predicted level. You can see there's a bit of a summary here. Uh, again, we can change what's displayed in this summary table. We can mess with that later. For now, all we care about is this picture. Here's our, our picture of our, our histogram of the predicted E. coli levels on here. The nice thing is that you can right click on this and copy and uh, it is an image. So that would work nicely. You can put that right into a Word document or into some other image editor or something like that. Um, 
I think you can export it as a PDF by itself, but that seems relatively useless. You can also type into this document under the edit pane and create a whole like working document here where you can show all the stuff that's put in from Jamovi, but it might just be easier to copy and paste those elsewhere. So here's our histogram. Uh, one of the things that we talked about was that it might be interesting to split this out by beach name. And so, ooh, we've got this terrible table up here, right, where it looks at the sample size, the minimum and the maximum for each of these beaches. Let's just change our descriptive things to be variables across rows. That's going to be a little bit of a cleaner uh, a cleaner summary table. But now you can see these histograms in here. They're stacked nicely on each other, and you can see some of the interesting things that are happening, right? You can see, hey, the Montrose Beach has a kind of a shifted distribution to the right. It's got, on average, higher predicted levels of E. coli, and you can see it tailing off a little bit. It's tricky to see on your screen, maybe, but if you're following along, or if you've got this document open and you're playing with it, you can maybe see like, okay, there's some stuff happening up here in the tail, whereas like the Ohio and Oak Street beaches have very low levels of uh, predicted E. coli. What we could also do instead of looking at the histograms is take a look at the actual data jittered, which means that we're taking a look at actual data points stacked on top of each other and then just kind of shifted left and right so they're not just all in one line. And then they have a bit of transparency so that if you stack a bunch of them on top of each other, it gets dark. And then you can see the really lightly shaded ones that's like single data points. So this gives us another picture of the distributions here. You can again see that that Montrose one is shifted up in this case, and it's got a tail going off because we had some a couple of measures of really high uh, predicted levels of E. coli. The 63rd Street one also had a couple of high ones, but this is really the Montrose one is the one that really creeps up the most. So we can take a look at some jitter data that way. Sometimes I think that's nice instead of, instead of a histogram. Um, we could talk a little bit about the drawbacks of this, but I'll let you think about that yourself. What we could also do is look under this exploration part and go into survey plots and do the same kind of thing here. The survey plots, some of them I think are actually a little bit better. So we'll, let's take a look at the same kind of plot, predicted level by beach name. And it's going to give us a whole bunch of things for continuous plots. I'm going to uncheck a bunch of these. These violin plots are like little distributions, kind of. They are very difficult to see because they're so small in this case. But let's take a look at the data. It orients it in a different orientation, right? The data is moving horizontally instead of up vertically. I think I might like that a little bit in this case. But also, it's got some pretty colors. Um, that's pretty cool. I like that. So you can play with which ones you like on here. What we could also do is take a look at some bar charts. And both the survey plots and the basic uh, descriptives ones uh, do some bar charts. So maybe what I'll do is I'll take down predicted level and I'll put up swim advisories. And let's just take a look at a quick little bar plot here. So, oh, I got to uncheck data. It was giving me a little message saying, hey, this is not a continuous variable. I can't do the data plot that you asked for. So here's our bar, bar plot of the overall distributions of no's versus yeses. Hopefully we had a lot more no swim advisories issued than yes, there is a swim advisory active here. Um, so we see that there's a real small amount here. You could split this up by beach name and it's going to get really gross, even though it seems like that should be good. Because what it does is it does a different distribution for each and it colors it. So maybe what we'll actually do is say, ah, I wouldn't mind if this part here, all the different colors corresponded to whether it was a yes or a no. And on the axis, wouldn't it be nice if we just had the beach names there? That means our variable is the beach name, and we're going to split this up by whether there was a swim advisory or not. So now all the red ones are no swim advisories, and then all the blue ones are yes swim advisories. And so you can see a little bit of a distribution for each beach. You can see, hey, Montrose had a lot of swim advisories issued compared to all the other ones, right? Interesting. Uh, this is something that we could also go ahead and take a look at down under the survey plots part. We can say, let's take a look at whether a swim advisory was issued or not. And again, we have these kind of ugly plots where yes and no are on our axis. We want the beaches on the axis instead. So let's put swim advisory down here. I like these plots because there's a couple of other options that we have on here. You can change what's being displayed from the counts, the frequencies, to percentages. 
So this is kind of neat. This, you see our whole graph shifted. And it's because when we look at the proportion of no's, um, or sorry, yeses, an active swim advisory, we can see that Montrose, that one beach, takes up 41% of the swim advisories. Well, that's partly because there just weren't many issued, but there was a decent amount there. We already saw that. Um, partly, though, um, just it's interesting. Uh, we can go back to counts if you want. Um, one of the other things I like doing is the stacked bar plots. I like these. So you can see, okay, here's kind of the makeup of all the no swim advisories. Here's the yes. This is impossible to see what's going on. We could switch this to percentages. And then you can see again, oh man, Montrose has taken up this huge amount. Uh, I think it's interesting in this case to switch what we have and group them actually by beaches. And this gives us kind of a different version of the plot that we have above, right? Where each of our beaches, uh, we're looking at the distribution of yeses versus noes. We have to be careful because the colors don't match on these, right? They're kind of off, offset a little bit. So that's a bit frustrating. But outside of that, I think these are some pretty good little tools that we might have. Um, one other thing that we should talk about is frequency distributions, uh, the actual tables that we might have. So I'm going to go back to this descriptive thing, and I'm going to just take a look at swim advisories. And I'm going to click the little frequency table here, and you'll notice that this is an option for nominal data and ordinal data. And it gives me this little table that, again, I can right-click and copy uh, and put in a Microsoft Word document or in a Google Doc or something like that. Um, and it gives me the raw counts of the no swim advisories and the raw counts of the yes swim advisories. It also gives me the relative frequency distribution here. And then it gives me a cumulative distribution, which is kind of interesting. Um, not super important or helpful in this specific case, but this table is certainly something that we might care about. And again, maybe we care about splitting this up by beach name. And we can see again, all right, here are all of our beaches along the top. We've got all of our, our stuff on the, the bottom. I'm just going to get rid of that plot for us. Uh, we've got all of our, our swim advisories on the bottom, yeses and nos. And again, you can see like, oh man, Montrose is just dominating the amount of swim advisories that are given out there. Although uh, Osterman and Calumet aren't that far behind. So hopefully this is something that's nice to see. And hopefully this video has been helpful uh, in prepping us for the types of things that we're going to do on this first lab. We're going to talk more about working with Jamovi this semester uh, in class, and I'll try and record a couple more videos so you can get a feel for how this looks. Good luck, everybody.